Hey, good morning, Rundle Christian Church. Yeah, that was our kind of our new bumper for something called Starting Point. And I want to real quick tell you what Starting Point is so that if you are in the room right now and you need to know about Starting Point, you know about it. Starting Point is a brand new thing we do. We do it on the first Sunday of every month. And guess what today is? First Sunday of October, which means we're doing a Starting Point lunch today. And what happens is we get together with anyone who would like to know more about our church, anyone who is new to Arundel Christian Church. Maybe this is your first time visiting right now and you, you're like, you know what, I want to learn more so I can decide whether or not Arundel Christian Church is the church for me. Uh, we want to invite you to come. We're, we're going to give you a really awesome lunch. I think we have Kadoba ordered for today. Uh, we're gonna, it, it's right at about 12.20, so after our second service downstairs behind the worship center. So if you would like to come to that, you're welcome. If you've been at our church for a long time and you've never actually started our track to become a member here, that lunch is the first step. So you will want to come and join us also if you are interested in joining the church. So make sure you uh, join us for Starting Point. It's an awesome time together. And also, like Max said, don't forget about one more. Right when you walk out these doors, there are all sorts of opportunities for you to learn about ways that you can help. And let me just say this. We have a bigger than normal need in our host ministry during our, our 10 o'clock service. Our, uh, yeah, yeah, 10 o'clock service. And our children's ministry has a larger than normal need during our 1130 service. So if you have some availability, if you've been like sitting there and waiting like, you know, I will help but I'm just waiting for, to really feel called by God right now. Right now, this is that moment. God is speaking through your lead pastor. We really want you to get involved. So make sure to visit, look at those opportunities, sign up for something, and then what we'll do is let you try it out. And if it's not a good fit, we'll, we'll find something else for you. So anyway, I'm really glad you're here. There's all sorts of great things going on right now. Our, our high school students are away at, our, at their fall retreat, and our middle school students are at their fall retreat. Some really cool things happening at both of those retreats. We're just excited for them. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for us because we're having maybe kind of the culmination as we're in this Who Needs God series. The culmination, maybe, is, is kind of like we're, we're at the kind of the peak, the prep, precipice, if you will, today as we're talking about this, this really difficult question. Of why would a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? Raise your hand if you've ever asked yourself that question. Right? You don't have to, to like turn on the news for more than a second, right? To, to see that there is all sorts of brokenness, all sorts of pain, all sorts of trouble in the world. There's things happening all over the place. And you, it, it, it makes sense to ask yourself, why would God... If he's good, allow this to happen. If there's a God who's all-powerful, why would he allow this to happen? And these are some really good questions. And the whole idea, the whole theme of this, this Who Needs God series is that we are not afraid of questions as a church. This is a really safe place to come ask questions. So if you've ever asked that question... This is a really good church to come and sit and explore this question together. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, here's what I've realized. I think the, the, the question that most people get stuck on is this. They say, if God is good, he would. As far as ending pain and suffering, if God is good, then he would. Or maybe the other side is, if he could, he would. So it's really like this question of if your God is really good, then there shouldn't be any pain and suffering. And if your God is all-powerful, then, then he should be able to do something about it. So what's really being questioned about God in, these question, in, in, these, in this question, really, is either he's, he's not good or he's not able. And this is this, this challenge that many people who struggle with belief in God, many people who struggle uh, with doubt, many people who say, you know what, I, some people will say this, I believe there's a God, but I don't want anything to do with him. And maybe there's those of us in this room who have moments where you struggle with those thoughts and maybe you've already decided that you don't want a relationship with God. And if that's you, I just want you to know I'm really glad you're here because we're going to have this conversation together. Uh, one thing before we pray and really get into this, just from 
a, a, a sheer position of logic. I want to put this, this thought up on the screen for you. And if you're taking notes for me, don't write this down. And here's why. You're going to need all 15 lines on your note sheet for something else. You'll see in a moment, all right? So don't, don't use up your space yet. Here's a thought. Injustice in the world calls into question the justice of God, not the existence of God. Let me explain this from a logic perspective. If my kids came up to you and said, hey, hey, Ken, my, you know, my, my daughter comes up to you in a small group and she says, Ken, I want you to know my dad, he doesn't, uh, doesn't ever care about me, he puts me in harmful situations, he lies about things, he never feeds me, he, he leaves for hours at a time and leaves all of us home alone uh, and, and just it tells you that all these things, I think what you would figure out is, wow, Matt is a really terrible father. You wouldn't jump to the conclusion that I don't exist. That wouldn't be the logical conclusion in this conversation is, well, if there, if, if there is pain and suffering in the world, therefore God doesn't exist. So what we have to understand, just from this logic perspective, is the fact that there is pain and suffering and injustice in the world, which we can all recognize that to be true doesn't necessarily disprove the existence of God. It might make you question whether or not you like God and the decisions he makes, but there's, it almost makes more sense to be angry with God in that situation than it does to to write him off altogether. And we're going to spend some time talking about God and why and how it is possible. I believe there is a God who is good and all-powerful and allows pain and suffering in the world. How can those three things go together? That's what we're going to explore this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we have time to, to have this conversation this morning, that you would open up our minds and hearts to hearing from you. God, I understand that all of us have a very clear example of something that's happened either personally or we've seen happen to other people around us. We've heard stories of, of just incredible devastation in, the, in weather recently. God, there are all sorts of things happening around us. And we, God, I'm asking that you would help us to, to lay aside our, just our, our prejudices against you this morning. To, to be open to the idea that there is a good God who loves people who is capable of doing anything and yet allows pain and suffering in this world. God, as we explore that, I pray you give us ears and hearts that are willing to listen and hear you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And some of you know uh, one of my own personal examples of pain and suffering uh, from my childhood. When I, I'm going to tell you this story. And if you've heard it before, you'll have to sit there again. But... Um, so when I was a sophomore in high school, I, uh, I remember I had to go to the high school before everyone else in my family because I was in student government, and we had this thing called zero period. So you had to actually be at school before school. So I went uh, real early. I drove myself to school. I was a sophomore at the time. Uh, in California, you can, like, the day you turn 16, you're just, there's your license, and you're good. So I drove myself to school, and I was there early. Um, I, I, first period, I was there. Second period was my algebra class. And I remember sitting there, just a regular morning, and uh, someone came in and told the teacher that they needed to see me in the office. So I didn't know what that was about. Uh, it's not normal that I would get called to the office. Uh, so I walk, and I, I can tell that something is a little off about this. And I go, and when I sit in the office... I'm sitting there by myself, uh, and nobody, the principal's not there, nobody else is there. I think it's a little weird. And about two minutes later, my sister, who's a freshman, the same high school, she walks in and sits down. I'm like, all right, hey, Kim, what's up? I don't know. And about five minutes later, my brother, who's a senior in the same high school, walks in and sits down. And we're all sitting there looking at each other, wondering why is nobody coming in this room talking to us? And it starts to, you know, our minds start running, right? Something must be wrong. Why do they want all the Oz dolls in a room together? And who are they waiting for to come talk to us? 
about after about 15 minutes, the, the door opens and it's my dad who happens to be a high-level executive within the school district. And he comes in, and I've never seen my dad in tears ever before. And he is beside himself. And he explains to us that that morning, suddenly, after we had all left for school, my mom had a massive heart attack and had passed away. Completely unexpected, right? She was healthy. She was fit. There was no signs that, that, that something like this would happen. There wasn't no expectation. Just all of a sudden someone saying, hey, you left this morning and everything was normal and now your life is going to be completely different. I'm sitting there looking at my, my sister, you know, a 14-year-old girl, only daughter, just lost her mom suddenly. Fast forward about five, six years, and I get a call from my dad. My dad has uh, melanoma skin cancer, and they caught it too late, and he has six months to live. I haven't had my first child yet. Luckily, my dad was able to come to our wedding, but I'm thinking, God, why in the world do you keep doing this to me? Why do you keep doing this to my brother and sister? What, you know, I, I, I went to to the college to study youth ministry and I, I want to dedicate my life to serving you and I'm, I'm doing all these things because I, I love you and yet you seem to just keep attacking. Like I'm, I, I'm that one guy in college who, who has lost both of his parents. That's, that's weird. And it was just this, it is, this interesting thing. That if, why, God, if you're good, why are you allowing bad things to happen? And let me tell you this right now. I want to tell you, I recognize that things have happened to everyone in this room. I'm not standing up here saying, listen, I'm the one with this really great sob story. Because listen, I recognize that real things that have happened in your life, I would hear your stories, some of your stories, and say, man, I can't even imagine what that must have been like. Because all around us we experience real pain and suffering, and it begs this question. It begs the question of why would a good God allow these things to happen to me, a good person? I want you to write this. This is your big idea. This is your first line, what I want you to write down. The big idea is this. To really explain the answer to this question, you have to understand this one concept. You can't have love without the freedom to not love. Write that down. I'm going to explain it here in a, month, in a minute. You can't have love without the freedom to not love. What this really means is that God loved us so much that he is so full of love that he built into this, this, this creation a free will. In other words, he gave each of us the ability to decide for ourselves our reaction and our response to his love for us. And I could spend a lot more time on this right at this moment, but I'm going to wait a little bit later into this message. But I want you to understand this idea of free will is really what it's all about. And in order to understand this, what I want you to do is if you're taking notes this morning, go ahead and number. You have 15 lines. Now you only have 14 left. Go ahead and number 1 through 10. And I'm going to spend some time giving you what to write down. And the first one I want you to write down is this. That God created a perfect world. I'm just going a little bit uh, back into you know, the, the beginning of time to understand why a God would allow bad things to happen to good people. You really have to understand all the way back from the beginning. And the first one is God created a perfect world. He created, uh, in fact it says in Genesis 1:31. Then God looked over all he made, and he saw that it was very good. So I believe that God created everything. He created everything the way he wanted it to be. He created everything with perfect harmony. Even what he created got along with itself. Uh, Humans got along with animals, and humans got along with God, and nature got along with the planet, and everything was in this like ideal setting, the, the perfect way that God wanted it to be. That's number one. So write that down. God created a perfect world for us to share. 
Number two is that God loved what he made. God loved what he made. In fact, he still does. I want you to know there's not been a moment in the history of of creation that there was ever a blip of time that God stopped having intense love for you and for me. He has loved us intently the entire time. And when he created man, he had this this special situation in mind. And what he did, unlike anything else he created, he created all these other things. He created plants and he created animals. But then when he created man, he did something really special. And he breathed his own life into man. And he created man and woman in his image. Completely unlike anything else God made, the love that he has for what he made, and specifically for you and for me, is unique. In fact, he created us with a soul. He created us uh, with this uh, unique ability, a unique connection to him that no other thing in creation could even get close to. We even find out the angels, in a way, are, are a bit jealous of this ability that we have to be saved by God, this, this connection, this love that he has for us. So number two, God loved what he made. We see this in Genesis 1.27. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Number three, this is your third line. God gave us the freedom to love him in return. Remember, this is kind of that, that one that everything else hinges on. That God loved you so much that he gave you the freedom to love him in return. Here's why this is important. This is really, really important. He wanted the love that you had for him in return to be genuine. In other words, if he created you like a robot, if he programmed you to love him in return, is that really love at all? When I was in elementary school, I've, I've always been a bit of a nerd, okay? And when I was in elementary school, I was like the, the guy, the kid who, when everyone else went out to recess, uh, they turned on the computers and you could use them. And I was that guy who stayed in to learn how to program a computer, all right? And I, I created these really, uh, one time I created this program that the very first question it asked, it asked what your name was and you typed in your name. And then it asked questions about you, and you would, you would tell it the answers to the questions. You would hit enter every time you answered a question. And at the very end of it, the way I programmed it is if you had said that your name was Matt, it complimented all the answers to your questions. It was, oh, that is just the ideal uh, height. Wow, this is really great. And wow, you must be very handsome. And this whole program just thought so highly of me somehow. And if you put any other name in that program... It would just completely like, you know, down you. Like, oh, that's, that's dumb or whatever. So I'd have my friends. I thought it was hilarious. Hey, come in. Check this out. I put my name in, answer the questions. Wow, this is pretty cool. Why don't you try it? Right? I thought this was the funniest little program. But here, at the end of the day, did I walk away from this computer thinking, wow, this computer loves me. This computer really thinks I'm pretty swell. Of course I didn't because I told the computer to tell me that. And what happens if if God creates you and he programs in you an inability to not love him in return, what he's got is a bunch of little love robots who say, I love you on demand. And don't actually have any real genuine choice in the matter. And that isn't love at all. That goes back to that big idea that in order to truly love, you have to have the freedom to not love. And God wanted genuine love from his creation. So he created us and said, listen, I'm going to create you and I'm going to love you and I'm going to give you this this really good thing that I've made. I'm going to make you extra special and then I'm going to give you the freedom to decide how you want to respond because I don't want a bunch of robots loving me. I want people who choose to love me. In Revelation 3, 20, it's a beautiful picture of this. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. This is God speaking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. This is a picture of God 
standing at the door of a house knocking. This is not a God who has a, you know, a master key to every heart in this room and forces his way into your life. This isn't a God who, you know, SWAT team version, you know, kicks the door down and comes in and be like, here I am, you can't do anything about it, God. This is a God who's standing outside the door giving you the choice whether or not you want to open the door and let him be a part of your life. See, God gave us the freedom to love him in return. And the other side of that, really, is to choose not to. Here's number four. We chose our own way. We chose our own way. We can go all the way back to the original sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, and we find out this story that Adam and Eve, they they lived in what was good, they had this, this share the same planet relationship with God. They had everything was in perfect harmony and there was just one thing they weren't supposed to do. In order for God to have this free will of saying, listen, I want you to be able to choose whether or not to do things my way or your way. I'm going to put this one tree, this, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And your only rule, this is the choice I'm giving you, is to not touch the, the fruit on this tree, not to even touch the tree, just leave it alone, and we're going to be good. And what Satan does, you know, in the form of a serpent, in the, in the story, in the, the original sin in, in Genesis, we see that the serpent deceives men, deceives Adam and Eve, and, and convinces them, listen, if, if you want to be like God, take from that tree and eat it. He's lying to you. And just like back in the original story, Adam and Eve decided to do things their way instead of God's way. They took their free will and chose to be gods of their own lives instead of following the God who created them. And I can just point back at Adam and Eve and give all the blame to them. And there's a lot of blame to be placed all the way back at the the beginning. But there's not a person in this room, myself included, that doesn't make those same decisions every day to do things our own way. We know that there is a good way, God's way. There's a way that is, is good and it leads to life. And there's, there's this other way. And we oftentimes, more often than we like to admit, more often than we want anyone to know, we choose to do things our own way, don't we? We choose our own way. In fact, Isaiah 53, 6 makes it very apparent. He says, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Remember, God's path, he created this good and perfect place for us to share together. And we, at some point, chose, through original sin and through sin of our own, we've chosen to do things our own way off of the path that God designed for us. Here's number five. God is just and holy. You know, we oftentimes talk about how loving God is. We like to say that God is love, but we leave off this more important part that God is also just. God is just. I picture these, these, you know, the scales of justice. You know, when something bad happens or something wrong happens, there's this scale that gets kind of off kiltered right and one side is weighed down more than the other and we have a just God a God who has an order and a way to do things and when things are out of order there is this thing called justice where there's something that has to be placed on the other side to balance things out that's what justice is and all of us when something bad happens and someone else is the one who's responsible for it we all claim to really love justice, right? When someone does something to you or your car or something, right? We want justice. We want things to be made right. And it's amazing to me that when we're the ones responsible, all of a sudden we we start being real big fans of mercy, don't we? Hey, mercy. But at the end of the day, we understand justice and we, we, we understand, uh, you know, fairness and we, 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 we see, like, this importance. And the God that we serve is a just God and a holy God. In Psalm 33, 5, it says, He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. And not only is, 
is God just, but he's also holy. In uh, Revelations 4, we actually see the, the you know, angels around God are, are singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In other words, God isn't just holy. God is holy, holy, holy. We don't see in the Bible that God is love, 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 or God is just, just, just. God is merciful, merciful, merciful. We see that God is holy three times. You see, that, is a very also, that also is a very important piece of this puzzle of understanding why a good God would allow bad things to happen to good people is this idea that God is just and holy. In 1 Samuel 2.2, about the holiness of God, it says, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. So let's pause for a minute. We have this really great thing that God created. He created man and woman extra special. Then he gave us the freedom to choose to love him in return and do things his way. We chose to do things our own way. And now we have to understand that there are going to be natural consequences because there is a just and holy God who also happens to be loving. And we'll talk about that. But here's number six. Is that holiness and sin don't mix. Holiness and sin don't mix. You see, sin caused a rift in our relationship with God. In fact, it really brought one of the worst consequences of all in that when we said, hey, God, we want to do things our own way, God said, all right, you can have what you want. You want to do things your own way, I'm going to give you the world that, that you're asking for. I'm going to give you a, a world where your free will, uh, this, uh, the opportunity to choose to do things my way or to choose to do things your way, you have it. Here it is. And unfortunately, this, this relationship we had with God in the beginning, this walk on the same planet relationship, this kind of uh, God in physical presence with us in this perfect union this, this was now broken. When we choose to do things our own way, God can. In, in all of his holiness, there, there is no part of him that can put up with our sin. In fact, it is so broken. We see in Leviticus that after sin, there, there was this thing, right? There was this, in the temple, there was the, 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 the temple, and there was these, this room, and inside that room, there was this other room called the Holy of Holies. And outside of that room, there was a curtain, because God was so holy and everything on the outside of this curtain was so broken. That's you and me. Everything in this world is so broken that in his holiness, there, it's kind of like you know, that curtain in first class, right? I mean, once it's pulled, you know you're not allowed past it, right? And it's kind of this, this idea that there is now this curtain. There's this physical, symbolic divide between us and God. The God who we used to share a planet with, we no longer do. There is now... A, a serious rift in our relationship. And that brings us to number seven. What was good is now broken. What was good is now broken. They say we had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And evil was now known. In a way, we got exactly what we were told we'd get. We ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now evil was this thing that was, was very real and was very known, and there was this now this good and this bad, this two sides, this, this good and evil that was now a very real thing in our understanding and our abilities and in our, our abil you know, when we're making decisions on if we want to do things our way or we want to do things God's way, there was this knowledge now that there's two different ways. When, we, uh, when my wife and I, we bought our our minivan this last time around. We got it from an auction, and when it came, there was this little, small, little, like, dent or a crack in the front windshield, like a rock had hit it, right? It was a small little thing, and the guy that we got the car from said, listen, I'm going to put the auction sticker right over it, so when you go through inspection, they won't even notice. You won't have to repair that, and we're like, great. 
So he does that. We run it through inspection. They don't notice. Perfect, right? We don't have to spend a bunch of money replacing this windshield because of a small little uh, dent. Dent is not the right word. Crack? Crack, that's the word. All right, so because of a small little crack. And then when it comes time to renew it, I remember this one time now we're going through, and now it's not this little thing anymore. You know, it's got these little things coming out from it. It's, now it's a little harder to hide. And I don't have an auction sticker to put over it anymore. So we're thinking, let's just see. You know, let's not mention it and see if they notice because we didn't have the money at the time to fix it. And uh, we went through, and the guy doesn't notice it. And at the end, he says, yeah, I think uh, one of your side tag lights is out. And I'm like, I've already come this far. Would you mind just double-checking for me? I should not have said that. I should not have asked him to double-check my my tag light. And sure enough, he's like, sure. He goes around, and on his way around, he's like, oh, and you have a crack on your windshield. (sighs) Now, that tag light, that would have been like, what, a $10 fix? And now I have a $400 fix. It's this idea that this, things that are broken, you know this, when you see a crack in glass, if, as soon as it's cracked, it's, it just grows, right? This crack gets bigger and bigger. And we see this in our world that just seems to get more and more broken. We see evidences everywhere we look that there is more sin. And we, the more humans are alive, the more ways we think of disobeying God. The more evil we become, the more ways we figure out to do things uh, in just a a way that's completely opposite from the way God designed it. And we see this brokenness of sin. We see destruction of nature. We see this this emptiness of our souls. Everywhere we look, we we see evil and we see what seems to be injustice and we see pain and suffering in this world. The world where we were given the freedom to do things God's way and said, no, we want to do this our own way. We want to do things our way. Romans 8, 22 and 23 does a really good job explaining this groaning. It says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Have we not seen that? In the last couple of months, so many different ways. We see it in our, our politics. We see that in natural disasters. We see that in, in uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes. We see, man, this earth is groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. And this leads us into number eight, is that God keeps on loving. Despite everything that I do on a daily basis that says, God, I would rather do things my way than your way, for whatever reason, that God continues to love me in a love that I could never even fathom. He never stopped loving me. He never stopped loving my wife. He never stopped loving my girls. He never stopped loving you. In all of the pain and all of the suffering, even though he is all-powerful and at any moment could just stop it and turn us into robots, instead, he's decided, for whatever reason, to allow it, and we'll talk about that here in a second, to allow it, and yet to continue to love us and draw us nearer to him. He sees the pain and suffering of the world. And he longed to enter into it to save us from it. We see in Isaiah 54.10, it says, For the mountains may be removed from the hills and, or Sorry, the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake. We get, see this kind of natural disaster being explained. But my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Number nine, God entered into our pain to save us through Jesus. Jesus. 
God could have sent Jesus to fix our sin problem at any moment he could have. He could have waited until this moment in time to do it. But for whatever reason that God only knows, he chose to pick the moment in our history where the most heinous and most painful way to execute someone had been invented and was being practiced. Something that uh, just is, is incredibly painful, something that is incredibly awful. That's the moment that God said, you know what, I'm going to pick right now to send my son the solution to this, this brokenness and this pain and this sin problem you've created. I'm going to send him into the earth at this moment. I'm going to send him into your pain and suffering. Not only am I going to send him into your pain and suffering, he is going to firsthand experience the same pain and suffering you experience on a daily basis and ultimately go through this last moment of his life on earth before his resurrection where he experienced a pain and suffering unlike anything we could ever imagine. You see, Jesus, because he continued to love you, he wanted to provide a way for you to choose again to love him in return. He doesn't want to force you to love him. He doesn't want to just fix everything so that we have no reason but to love him. He allows the things that are happening to happen because we we kind of made our own bed and he's saying, listen, I love you still and I'm going to give you a way back to me and it's my son Jesus. I'm going to send him into your pain and suffering to die as he lived a perfect life and I'm going to send him to die and, and all you have to do is put your faith in him and all the stuff that you did, all those times you chose to do things your own way, he's going to pay the price for those and you can be made holy again. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's a beautiful verse, right? It's one that we, we recognize and we know. He entered into our pain to save us through Jesus. Here's number 10. God has a good plan for you. Romans 8, 1 through 2 says it this way. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Isaiah 30 puts it this way, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. You see, the scales are off kiltered. And God had a plan to make things right again that involve you being able to be restored into a right relationship with Him. And it's this incredibly beautiful story called the, the Gospel. You should have four lines left. And here's what I want you to write on them. So, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? The first one is to fulfill a greater purpose. To fulfill a greater purpose. You see, in his infinite wisdom, he knows far better than you or I what is good for us. He knows all the things that happened. When my mom passed away, he already knew that two of my uncles were going to give their life to Christ at her funeral. He knew that I wasn't going to end up going to Biola where I thought I was going to go, that I was going to go to Liberty University where I met my wife because my mom wasn't there. He knew how everything was going to work out for my good. It's that first one to fulfill a greater purpose. The second one, to draw us back to Him. God allows pain and suffering to draw us back to Him. You know, pain, you ask any doctor and they'll tell you that pain, ultimately, by design, is a really good thing. In fact, people who struggle with different 
uh, diseases where they can't feel pain or their pain receptors are numb or, or missing, that, that can be a very dangerous thing because if something happens to that limb and you don't know about it, it can be very dangerous. Pain was designed to help us realize that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Number three, it's to increase our awareness of his goodness. You know, we sometimes forget how awesome it is to be able to use some of the just the incredible gifts God's given to us. You know, just looking at your fingers, we, we take it you know, for granted how amazing they are until something stops working. And in that moment, you realize why and how awesome God is for providing them at all. And sometimes he allows bad things to happen to good people to increase our awareness of the good gifts we have all around us. And a fourth reason, the final reason, is to discipline those he loves. And we look at discipline kind of as a, we, we picture kind of a, you know, a child getting a spanking or, you know, and discipline is so much more than just bad things happening when you do something wrong. Now, that's part of it. God, I think, allows and ordains sometimes things in our lives as a form of discipline. But, but discipline is more than just that. Discipline is when you, you, you see the word di- disciple in that word discipline. It's when you take something and you mold it and you form it and you help it to be a better picture of Christ. And God allows pain and suffering in our lives to help mold us and form us and to discipline us. It's amazing that God loves us despite all that we've done. The fact that God knows the things that I, I know that I've done, the, the myriad of times I've chosen to do things my own way instead of God's way, and yet he never stopped loving me, and he never stopped loving you. And he provided a way through Jesus. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to spend some time answering this question, who needs God? I do. You do. Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now that you would be with us uh, as we walk out of this place today. Father, I pray that you would, you would go with us and into our weeks with us. Help us to ponder some of these things, God. As we're exploring some of our questions, the things that cause us to, to struggle in our faith, I pray that you would constantly be providing answers for us and, and whispering into our, our minds and our hearts and providing people to come alongside us and have these conversations with us. But God, I have truly arrived at a, a point in my faith where I, I understand why you allow bad things to happen to good people. You are a good God and you are fully powerful and capable and yet you have a plan that is so much better than I can ever fathom in in the why you do what you do. God, I thank you for loving me so much that you pulled me out of my sin and provided a way for me to be restored back into a harmonious relationship with you. God, if there's anyone in this room that needs to accept you for the first time and recognize that you are a good God who loves them, who sent his son to this earth to die for them, God, I pray that they would have the courage this morning to come and to speak with me or someone else here at the front of the stage so we can talk with them about that. God, we thank you and we love you for all that you do, good and bad. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.